Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast with Mark Buhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould. In each episode of the Survivalist Podcast, we look at different events and catastrophes that could happen to you. Then we give you the knowledge, resources, and recommendations you need to survive. The Survivalist Podcast is brought to you by Forge Survival Supply. In an era of uncertainty, Forge Survival Supply provides more than emergency supplies. We bring you and your family peace of mind. Use the promo code SURVIVAL at checkout at ForgeSurvivalSupply.com for 10% off your order. This podcast is sponsored by Epic Water Bottles and Pitchers. Every year, millions of Americans get sick from drinking contaminated water. Epic water filters remove chlorine, heavy metals, chemicals, industrial pollutants, pesticides and herbicides, iodine, and microbiologicals from your water. This is done with BPA-free, recyclable bottles and pitchers that are made in the USA. So keep your family safe and healthy with Epic Water. You can use the promo code WATER at epicwaterfilters.com for 10% off your order there. One other thing, please rate this podcast wherever you listen to it, whether it's Podbean, iTunes, Stitcher, wherever. Please rate us. It's very important to us, and we really want to know what you think. And thanks again for listening. Welcome to the Survivalist Podcast. This is episode 19. I'm here with Mark and Doc as usual. This is Matt Gould, and today we have a special guest, one of the best-known voices in the survival field, Tim McWelch. Hey, Tim, how are you? Oh, my God, what an intro. Thank you. You're too kind. Good morning. (laughs) Well, I I don't think it's too kind because, Tim, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on any of this, Tim, but you're the founder and chief instructor of a school called Advanced Survival Training in Virginia. Uh, That is correct. You've been one of the most trusted sources for survival training in the Mid-Atlantic since you opened in 1997. That is also correct. (laughs) You published a series of survival manuals for Outdoor Life magazine, which are all uh, New York Times best-selling titles, such as Hunting and Gathering. uh, Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the first three. The first three. um, The first three. Just to be clear. Okay. Uh, But great books like Hunting and Gathering Survival Manual, The Natural Disaster Survival Handbook, How to Survive off the grid and how to survive anything, which is something that I want to talk about today, that book, How to Survive Anything, which I uh, just read and love. Um, anything else you want to talk about, Tim? You know, I, I, uh, I want to hear what you guys want to talk about. That's, that's what excites me is to, to have an opportunity to, to meet and, and share with people that I wouldn't ordinarily bump into in my neck of the woods and, and to, uh, you know, to, 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 to have a melding of the minds with, with other professionals in the industry. There, there aren't that many of us, you know, there really aren't at the end of the day. So I'm, I'm just geeked up to, to be here. And I, I thank you so much for having me on the podcast. Great. Thank you. And one thing I want to say is we're going to do a, a book giveaway. We've been asking people uh, as we get savvier with our podcast, we've been asking people to give us reviews, which we um, really mm-hmm. want. So uh, first person to give us a review on this episode, we're going to give them a book, a signed copy of one of your books, Tim. And, and which book do you want to give them? Let's do How to Survive Anything. That's, uh, that's what we're focusing on today. And I will, I will sign a copy and, and get that right out to our lucky winner. Okay, so be the first person to give us a review on our book. Uh, uh, get, sorry, be the first person to give us a review of our podcast this this particular podcast episode and we will and tim will send you a book uh we'll uh after you give us the review we'll find out the details of how to send that to you okay so let's get started um i want to talk at the the very first page of your book tim how to survive anything is uh where you have a chart of the matrix uh and can you tell us about the matrix sure um so the the editors at outdoor life and i wanted to create some kind of system where people could could look at a glance and kind of ascertain okay am i am i really worried about something real or am i am i worried about something that's that's kind of way off in the in the twilight zone so we wanted to come up with with some kind of of um construct where different types of scenarios would be graded they, they'd essentially be ranked from dangerous to deadly and very likely to pretty much just in the movies. And, and that's what this, this matrix is that we've included in the book. So each of the different scenarios that we present in How to Survive Anything 
is is ranked uh, uh, on this on this matrix system that we created. Right, and so on the you know the side of most likely to happen, but not as dangerous. What like what's an example of something there? Well, um, you know it's it's not very um, it's not very very high on the radar for for most survival enthusiasts, but a house fire. A house fire could could be a, uh, a a total game changer for you and your family. And there's a section in the beginning of the book on ways to prepare yourself so that that house fire never happens. But we also go through different ways to to deal with a house fire in the event that that uh, you know your number was up. It just happened. Yep. And then uh, sort of on the on the very other uh, end, which is only in the movies. Uh, probably the the most deadly and most uh, only in the movies is is that a zombie apocalypse or what is that number forty eight? <laughs> well, for for all our Walking Dead fans out there, I, I think they're going to want to say uh, zombie apocalypse and they're going to want us to chime in and and agree with them on on the whole zombie issue. And and we did actually uh, put this book together a little bit tongue in cheek. Um, we did it A to Z. So the first, the first thing, which is in that very likely category, uh, the first issue in the book is animal attacks. And, and then the last thing we cover in the book is zombies. So we, we actually did a little A to Z um, set up there for this book. But, um, man, let's, uh, let's talk about zombies. You, uh, you guys ever, you ever seen a zombie? Oh, that was oh, yeah, Wow. Um, Lots of them. Yeah. yeah. You seen a zombie? So I got a teenager. Time, yeah, she, she the, like a zombie uh, in the morning. The zombie stuff. <laughs> the uh, the dudes, and the guys in Miami doing uh, flaca, like basalt stuff, mm-hmm. going um, in a deranged state and um, superhumanly strong, and they're uh, they're going nuts. And they remember the guy was trying to like <laughs> eat a guy's face off or something on the side of a bridge. But uh, I read yeah. about those basalts maybe six to eight months ago, and they're in certain areas of the country, specifically Florida, like Fort Lauderdale and South, I think is what this article showed, is that people are buying this, this basalt shit from the Middle East or China, very, very dirt cheap, and it's like an ecstasy-type euphoric drug that puts people in a manic state, manic and mm. um, with crazy strength, and they're, uh, they're going nuts, and... I think it was reported on 60 Minutes a, a, a year or two ago, too. But that uh, induced that zombie person that we've heard about probably in the last five years about someone trying to eat another person that mm-hmm. um, I'd like to shoot in the head. But uh, anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I you know all academic on you, but I, I have a different <laughs> take on the zombies that um, use them more as a metaphor to explore – survival scenarios where something is just a little bit behind you in your skills. It seems that the speed of the zombie is always just slightly under the person that imagines it, and they're just slightly smarter. So to me, the, it, the zombie is more of a, a safe way to play with survival scenarios where you may actually have to you know, attack, kill, um, shoot something that looks like a human. So uh, I, I really think they're very important I don't know like not only a genre but also just so we can explore those things versus trying to imagine a literal war zone or Syria or Aleppo or something where you're having to make those terrible decisions so zombies to me are a a fabulous vehicle for exploring survival yeah I agree with you doc I mean I think of zombies as as a metaphor also but a metaphor for unprepared people when you know a real uh, end of the world as we know it event happens so that um, you know if you have your food and shelter and water and protection all put together uh, and other people don't you know it's like we've talked about many times before uh, before long they're going to be coming to try to get what you have yep yeah. mm-hmm. so you, yep and you think they are the walking them. dead those unprepared masses um, the the uh, uh, the hungry and, and thirsty and desperate masses those are the walking dead that's what I think yeah the desperate masses, yeah. yeah, because I think about what I would do for my kids, uh, you know, if they didn't have anything to eat, it, you know, it w- I would do a lot for them, and I think everybody yeah. would. So sure. I think that's what you kind of have to be 
be prepared for. And I think that's why we, we really uh, are preaching the gospel of preparedness so that there's fewer zombies and more people when the, you know, when and if an event, a, a big life-changing event happens. Mm-hmm. So yeah, to take that, that one step further, I think the, the zombie represents the actual loss of whatever makes us human. So you mm-hmm. can't trust them, or you, or they're like maybe sharks. They're, they're predictably unpredictable. They will just relentlessly come at you, and you can't have a pause. You can't assume that they're going to have any compassion. You know, all of the things that we assume about people are missing. So again, I think using that metaphor, it prepares you for a, a, a world just turned upside down, which is probably a good one to prepare for. That's a it's a tough one to prepare for though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, yeah, because you have no idea this was what, easy. <laughs> what people are going to do, and like we've said many times, when the ma- the, the the masses go hungry for days, what what do they do, or what are they likely to do, or do they even know what they're capable of, or Matt or myself or Tim, if, if you guys have kids, what are you going to do to protect and feed your child? What steps are you right. going to go to? What amount of force or deadly force are you going to use to put food in your child's mouth? Or, or your mouth. Right. If you have for days. So yeah. <clears throat> deep questions, guys. <laughs> very deep I, questions. So very deep. Yeah, what what would you do? How how far would you go? So would you would you kill strangers to feed your children if their children are about to die? You know, they, they have a even a limit. Month. Yeah. Why yeah, limit I, exactly. strangers? Family right, members. Right. So are you, yeah, <laughs> you know, are you we're gonna, gonna carry kill? this out. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. That's and and you know this really brings up a, um, a a very infrequently discussed topic, which is survival ethics. So, in a desperate situation, how much of your normal everyday ethical standards, how how many of those are going to transition into that? into that crisis setting. So, you know, are we still going to try to help others if we can, um, you know, or is that going to go out the window? Um, are, are we going to obey the basic laws of the land? Um, you know, you're, right now you're not allowed to, uh, you know, shoot somebody and kill them just because they stole something. So let's say, you know, somebody, uh, you can't, you, know, you can't in Texas. Well, that's, yeah. And that's a whole other country. So we'll, <laughs> yeah. for the other, for the other 49 <laughs> states, uh, <laughs> yeah. For the, for the other 49 states, um, you know, stealing is not viewed in, in a court of law uh, as, as, you know, equal to, equal to killing. So this is something that, that, that people, I think, would have to grapple with because our, our hardwired response to thievery in, in desperate times, I think our hardwired response is going to be to kill. And, and we have that, I think, from our ancestors. So if you, if you jump back uh, a century or uh, a millennium, if somebody stole all your food that you had built up for the winter, okay, if somebody steals all that from you, they've essentially killed you, haven't they? You're going to starve to death. So in yes. that scenario, them stealing from you is equal to them killing you slowly. And, and at the end of the day, it's them killing you. So your natural response is to kill them back. And, and so I think that's something that we, we literally have wired in, like in the, in the little remote caveman part of our brain. Um, I, I think that's why we feel this difficult to suppress feeling of, of anger and and not just anger, but um, you know, a, 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 an eagerness to do violence upon a thief, and, and I think that's something that that we have we've got as as almost a, a survival trait. You know, if you didn't well, have not that, only that, if not only you that, didn't have that, then then people would steal from you and you'd starve. But it's it's the survival instinct, and it's on. I mean, we see it in our face. We watch it on Sunday night. We watch it in cowboy movies we we see it we're accustomed to it and i'm not trying to get into the well video gamed it i mean i don't play video games but i know i know men who play freaking video games shoot them up games we're accustomed to violence and shooting people not into get i'm not trying to get into political 
or a higher level conversation. But sure. again, it goes back to, you know, what would you do? Would you cower or would you let those survival instincts kick in and go do some violence upon your fellow man to get food to feed yourself and your family? Yeah. Well, well in you a take lot door of cases, number three. <laughs> yeah. In a lot of cases, those instincts are passed to us from our ancestors. And, you know, to mm-hmm. go all biological on you, basically, you could look at it as the, the things that we have that we use to make decisions in survival situations are the things that we carried forward because those without those things didn't make it. I mean, right. we are exactly. the products of, of the, the long, long tail of this curve here. Mm-hmm. So we are what mm-hmm. survives. Yeah. 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 We're, we're the progeny of, of the people who had instincts that worked at that time. At that time, but, it's critical. Yeah. Now let's analyze that for a second. So, so back in the day, you know, where there's, where there's no rule of law to speak of, and it's, it's every man for himself, and you're just trying to keep your family alive so that your gene pool continues, although you're not thinking about it in those terms, but you're just, you're just trying to protect yourself and your, and your own, you know, the people that are under your care. Um, so is it different now? It, what, if, what if there was still rule of law in a disaster setting, you know, let's say we've got martial law declared in a disaster setting. Now, does that, does that make us reassess our instincts? Yeah. Well, I think it does. I think it does. And I, and I, and I was thinking what Doc, I was trying to channel what Doc would say, and Doc would probably say, you know, if you're uh, as prepared as you can be, you can avoid the violence by a show of force, mm-hmm. right? Is that... Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, there's also yeah. the other level that we're a societal being. And so we have all those that, you know, lived alone in the woods probably didn't have offspring and disappeared. So right. Right. the yeah. extreme <laughs> the side is also gone. So there is uh-huh. this innate need for working together as a society. And that would be that duality, that mental battle of personal survival versus, versus social survival. Yeah. And that's, that's, hardwired into us so we would struggle that's why we're having this podcast that's where the struggle is yeah yeah partially because we're going to create something or be handed something that's going to cause us to need to revert to our primitive survival but then also we're going to be carrying forward those those elements that allowed us to create the society in the first place now what do you guys think of what do you guys think about the difference between modern American society and let's say, you know, maybe another country who might have a higher value on societal continuation than, than we do. So for example, in Japan, um, you know, after the Fukushima disaster, so they had, they had the earthquake, they had the, the tsunami, they had that nuclear plant right on the shore and, and that thing, that thing, you know, that thing uh, imploded. And so people are reeling in the wintertime in Japan. And it's cold in the wintertime in Japan, not like, not like Montana, but it's still chilly. And so people are, are struggling. Their homes are destroyed. You know, their, their livelihood's gone. Their possessions are gone. And it's wintertime. And, you know, there's radiation and there's flooding. And, and it's just, you know, nightmare scenario for that small area. But there are stories of people respectfully standing in line and waiting for the supplies that, that have been allotted to them. And, you know, they're, 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 they're doing what they should do. Now, can you, can you take that disaster and plant it somewhere in a coastal town in America? So you've had, you've had an earthquake, you've had flooding, you've had a, a, a you know, radiological event occur and, do you think the average American person is going to stand in line respectfully and, and, you know, wait eight hours or or 12 hours, you know, to get a ration packet and a bottle of water and and whatever else? Well, actually, the, the, if you think about Japan, I mean, you've got say Tokyo and I actually deliberately walked or went through Tokyo's subway system during rush hour just to feel it. There are 13 Uh million people in Tokyo. So, what you've done is you, you, you've created an environment that simply cannot exist unless the people behave that way, unless they all follow the rules and they all wait their turn. 
Otherwise, it'd yeah. be chaos, and then you would never have had that situation. I mean, 13 million people in you know, a few dozen square miles, that's mm-hmm. astronomical. So they're a green as essentially like an insect colony to behave. Uh-huh. But once somebody breaks out of that, then it, it may cause the entire thing to fall apart rapidly. Whereas we're, I look at it as a little bit more independent. We kind of expect that. You know, somebody cuts in front of you and everyone's ready to, you know, have road rage. But that's, that's a function of our space, you know, our wingspan when we walk around. So, yeah, that's, that's the way I look at it. And I've, I've spent mm-hmm. time in Japan and it's, it's a whole different culture. Yeah, yeah. I remember so, when I was in Tokyo, I went down to the subway to take it and I, and I, uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't read anything. And I, I walked back up and got a cab because I couldn't. I couldn't deal with it. So yeah. You were braver than <laughs> I was. <your> survival. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the inverse of Texas. Yeah. So I wonder, you know, because, Tim, I feel like um, we're not making use of your excellent uh, skills as uh, in survival hacks and, and very, um, you know, how, very uh, defined how-to moments. So I wonder if we could take a look at the matrix and we could choose – an event that is close to unthinkable but could actually happen and then talk about some specific skills. And I think, you know, the Fukushima disaster is a great one to think about because uh, an earthquake and tsunami and subsequent radiological event could happen here pretty, pretty, uh, I mean, it could happen here, don't you think? It could. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of those things that's, that's, that's on the radar as a possibility. Um, And, and I honestly, I stress a little more about multiple events that are coinciding than just solitary events. You know, what if, what if, for example, um, you know, we had a terrorist attack and they were waiting on some other disaster to occur, and and that would be the signal for them to launch that attack. So then we we don't know which way to turn. You know, maybe there's an earthquake, and then maybe they're they're you know, successfully hacking the power grid and shutting down power. So we don't know if the, if the power's out because of the terrorist. We don't know if the power's out because lines are down and, and substations are, are broken up because of the earthquake. You know, we don't know what the hell's going on. And, and that's what bugs me is, is that one-two punch, um, you know, because, because we, can, we can often deal with one thing, uh, especially if it's in one area. We can't do that well when, when we've got multiple issues going on. You're right. So if, if we just play that scenario out, so there's a natural disaster of some kind, earthquake, tsunami, volcano, something near an urban area, because most Americans live in an urban area, right? And most people are not very prepared, maybe a little prepared. And then there's a terrorist attack on top of that. So you have civil unrest, uh, no power, and, uh, you know, very dangerous conditions. So what, what is it that you have to do first? Tim. The next part of the Survivalist podcast is brought to you by the Perry Blade Survival Knife, designed by SAS legend Mel Perry. For more information, visit perryblade.com. That's perry, P A R R Y, blade.com. You know, first and foremost, we're going to worry about the, the security and, and physical safety of ourselves and our loved ones. You know, this is, this is going to be. This is going to be the, the, the most important thing in, in any survivor's mind. And the way that we maintain that safety and security may vary depending on the situation. You know, these are, these are, these are wild-ass what-ifs that we're, that we're spitting back and forth. So, you know, maybe part of that safety and security is getting the hell out of Dodge while you still can, you know, and, and simply not being on the X. Or maybe that safety and security is kind of doing a gray man approach where, you know, you, you, you get your house squared away so that it, you know, it, it, it doesn't stand out. You know, it doesn't look like it's, it's going to have anything for looters to grab. Um, maybe you make your house look like it's already been robbed. So you could throw a bunch of, you know, old clothes out in the yard and, uh, you know, smash like your old gross TV that you don't use anymore that's sitting in the basement. Smash that on the porch you know, make it look like you've already been robbed. Um, any, any of, the, any of the, the hundreds of different, you know, gray man techniques that just get you kind of off the radar for the people that would want to burglarize your home, do harm to your family, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So safety and security, that's, that's got to be number one. And then we worry about shelter. 
So a lack of shelter can, can kill a person in cold climates, in you know, it, different conditions where, where you'd suffer from hypothermia, or in heat. Um, you know, people, people always worry about hypothermia. They worry about being cold and, and freezing to death. But a lot of people forget about heat. You know, people die of, of heat exhaustion and, and heat strokes during those summertime power outages. Now, now, often it's, you know, elderly folks or people with, you know, poor health. Um, but, but, you know, even, even somebody who's healthy could, could get very, very ill and be taken, taken out of the game for a day or two uh, through heat exhaustion. We saw that with the Duranko which came through um, a couple years ago. It, it, it was that straight line storm that blew out of the Midwest and it swept uh, over the mountains in West Virginia and, and, and it ultimately hit DC. Um, but you know, we had 100 degree days with 100% humidity and the power's out and, and people are literally fighting over bags of ice that are being trucked in from other areas and uh, one gentleman in West Virginia was shot and killed over a loaf of bread at a, at a convenience store. Um, you know, and the, these are just isolated incidents as people shoot and kill each other every single day, you know, all through the country. But, but uh, you know, that one, that one probably had, had more, to, more to do with the storm than, uh, you know, just, just uh, you know, a violent criminal uh, doing what he was going to do anyway. Um, Right. So yeah, that's we what, uh, we that's worry what you're about talking yeah. about that convergence in a way, right? That the there's bad people that are waiting for the event so that they can take advantage of the event. I think so. I think so. Um, I, I believe I have met those people <laughs> from time to time at uh, at survival expos and, and prepper shows, and 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 these are the people that that watch way too much uh, of The Walking Dead and and you know doomsday movies and. And they, they hate their menial job, and they, they just want the world to burn, and they, they want to you know run around and be Rambo or whatever or, or Mad Max or something. Um, and yeah, there are there are people out there that want to do that, and there are people that are worse than that. Um, I mean, there's there's been rumors uh, for a while of of a guy in Virginia who's trying to set himself up as a warlord. Um, you know, it, it, you know, he's, he's stockpiling massive amounts of of things uh and and assembling you know this this small army um and um that's really scary to me you know even if it's only halfway true that that there are people out there that are thinking along those lines you know i myself i would rather have extra food set aside and have it earmarked to you know drop off at the local church in the middle of the night in a disaster and no one sees me, no one can follow me, you know, I just, I just do a good deed. You know, I'd rather have so much crap that I can, that I can give it away than, you know, have just enough and be willing to shoot people to, to protect it. You know, that's what I'd rather do. I'd rather feed people than shoot people at the end of the day. Um, and, and, of course, this, this is my current fat and happy um, you know, stance as a as a uh, American, a well-fed, um, you know, survival instructor in a, in a in a nice part of the country, in a nice town, in a nice state, you know, the whole deal. So, of course, all that could change, um, just depending on the scenario. But that's that's my line of thinking right now. I'd I'd rather have extra, and you know, I think every every person that I could take care of is one less predator. Um, but of course, you know, I can't take care of thousands of people like I have in my town. Um, and, and at some point, you know, um, at some point in a really horrible long-term disaster, you've got to, you've got to cut people off because they're just going to eat up all your food and they're going to starve to death anyway at the end of that. And you're going to starve to death. So we, we end up with that sinking lifeboat scenario where, okay, you've got a lifeboat that fits 15 people. And you've got 15 people in it. And then there's like, you know, two people splashing around on the edge begging to be let in. And you pull them up onto the lifeboat and then the whole damn thing sinks. And, and you know, we have to keep that in mind if we ever end up in a really nasty long-term scenario. And I'm talking about months, seasons, a year, more than a year. You know, you'd have to think about that, that lifeboat concept. Um, you know, you've, well, you're, you're, you've got to take care about... of your family. Um, first, you know, social triage, 
whether or not you accept certain aspects of humanity to continue forward. What's, you know, there, there's always a, the, the good scenarios, you know, where that old guy turns out to be the brain surgeon, but nobody asked what he did. They just assumed he was expendable, and the young, youthful, uneducated teenager was probably the future. You know, uh -huh. I, I have met one of those warlord people, by the way. Yeah. Um, in fact, I think he was testing me out a little bit as if I, he wanted me to maybe jump on his bandwagon. But he described in no uncertain terms a fairly sophisticated plan using horses and motorcycles to, with his buddies, he was a younger guy, to basically uh -huh. have a uh, marauder group. And he described exactly how they were going to uh, attack other people, where they were going, locations, yeah. the, the, basically a supply chain they were going to build up into yeah. their mountain retreat. And, yep. you know, that was, he was, as soon as they see someone, they're going to shoot them and get their stuff. You know, we went into other detail, but it was pretty right. practical, and I doubt he's alone. Wow. I mean, I, mean, I bet there no, are a lot of no. them. It was yeah. frightening. <laughs> You know, yeah, you know the way to the best way to get a prepper stockpile. Find a prepper, shoot him, take a stockpile. You know, people have been yeah. people have been joking about that for years. Um, the the Doomsday Prepper show on National Geographic. Uh, you know, after a couple seasons of that, there there started to be chatter about prepper predators. So the prepper predators are watching these shows and writing down names and towns, you know, and and cities and and okay, all right, we're going to look for this guy. Um, you know, in this town, and we we've seen all the all the crap he's got, you know, and and uh, you know, it, it was it was largely meant as a joke, but it does it does give us a window. You know, there's truth in all jest. There may only be a tiny bit, but there's there's still truth in all jokes, and and that's what you know that's what typically makes them funny, except when it's not really a joke, when it's when it's something a little a little more grim. But um, but yeah, I think uh, I think it would be very easy for for predatory people to uh, you know figure out who the preppers are and uh, you know and and or, or just figure out where the supplies are and uh, and and start you know uh, start having at it. Um, so yeah, so I just in this podcast, I'm, a... not gonna, I'm not going to I'm not going to tell any I'm not going to tell anybody where they can go. I'm not going to I'm not going to talk about which groups of people have stuff. And, and what kind of stuff they have, and, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna disclose that information because I'm sure there's some of those people listening to this, um, and and I I want them to take a long, hard look in the mirror, and I want them to take a long hard look at their soul, and if they're thinking about doing harm to others, just in in nice times, almost as a a form of entertainment. Like they're entertaining themselves with these these fantasies of of being Mad Max or or whatever, um, you know. If that's their entertainment, then they might want to go talk to a therapist or a psychologist or maybe even a psychiatrist, um, because that is not normal human behavior to fantasize about being a predator. It's not. I'm sorry. Um, and and sometimes this this survival stuff really brings out a dark side in people. You know, it just gives them an opportunity to to have all these these, you know, fantasies and just run wild in their imagination and and uh sometimes the results are are not very pretty. So I hope I hope our good friends <laughs> I hope our good friends in the in the law enforcement uh in realm uh are are keeping good tabs on these people that are forming um you know these uh different um um <laughs> warlord groups uh for lack of a better for, for yeah. lack of a better name i i agree well, with well, you yes the second that go ahead well, mark Tim, or this, doc this go is, ahead doc, doc um, i'm just curious i mean i i hear a lot of these scenarios um the lesser scenarios where people you know are trying to be hard targets or move the predators down the road or you know let them go um and i often think of of the situation where if you you're the hard target so you've made yourself uh, more defensible so those predators are going to go somewhere else but you see those predators or maybe you even have an encounter with them and you know you you force them off your land well does that solve the problem because if they could have attacked you or would have attacked you do you have an obligation to eliminate them so they don't carry their their evil forward 
because right, you've already right. encountered them. You, you're supposed mm-hmm. to be the smart one. You know, me personally, yeah. all I do is I Google New York Times bestselling authors for survival books and then make a address <laughs> list, and that's my my plan. But yeah, yeah, and 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 part of my plan is knowing about plans like that. And so part of my plan is that I have uh, I have got a uh, a uh, holdings company uh, which owns various properties uh, which has no uh, no affiliation with me whatsoever. Uh, no, I'm kidding. Um, but, uh, <laughs> no, I, I own a holdings um, company, so uh, I know who those properties are. Oh, uh-huh, so yeah, that was, yeah. You, you're just going deeper and deeper there. So, uh, <laughs> so, so right, I'm going to so, pay a random stranger with cash to uh, to rent a house for me, um, and uh, there, find that. <laughs> <laughs> So, but, uh, uh, but anyway, yeah. So a lot of times, no matter what kind of uh, scenario we're talking about, from the most exotic to the most basic, some of the things you have to do then are the same, right, Tim? So one of the things that you yeah. write about is uh, into the wild. In your set, your chapter called "Into the Wild," and and I think a lot of um, survivalists, that's one area they special, you know, they think about a lot. And so imagine there's a number of scenarios where you're going to have to go into the wild, or you might just be hiking and find yourself. Uh, having to survive in the wild. So tell, talk, let's talk about surviving in the wild, which I know you are an expert at, and Doc, and, and you, Mark. I, I am the uh, novice in this area. So, um, so yeah. tell us, uh, what, it, what are the survival priorities for surviving in the wild? Well, oddly enough, um, you know, that safety and security that we, we just talked about, um, that, can, that can come up really high on the list, depending on where we're at. So if we're in a place with a lot of big predatory animals, then that's just got to be on our radar. You know, if you're someplace that has a big black bear population or a grizzly bear population or, or you know, whatever, uh, mountain lions and gators and, you know, the, uh, uh, some of the Seminole Indian people, um, they escaped persecution and, and torment uh, by the Spaniards they escaped by going way out into the Everglades. And they went so far out there that, that no one dared to go and mess with them. But they, I mean, they're, they're right in the middle of Alligator Alley, you know, and, um, but, but they, they actually used those, those predators as a defense, as a natural defense, at great risk to themselves. But it was a brilliant strategy. Um, you know, some of, the, some of the traditional cultures around the world that have survived their, their encounters with uh, technologically superior other cultures, um, they did so by being so far removed from any habitable place that no one bothered them. Um, you know, deep, deep desert, uh, you know, above the Arctic Circle, uh, forward to Everglades, et cetera. Um, but, yeah, we, we need – Yeah, Montana. <laughs> Montana. <laughs> You know, we need, we need our security. Um, we also need shelter from the elements, whether it's heat or cold. And, and typically it's the cold that kills you, but the heat can do it too. So we need shelter from whatever elements are, are um, you know, uh, a hazard in that area, you know, heat or cold. We need water. We need safe drinking water. So I cringe every time I see one of these survival shows and the guy dips his hand into the river and, and takes a big, long swig. Um, what this is teaching our little Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and, you know, uh, uh, youth groups, you know, and whatever throughout the country is that it's okay to drink out of creeks and rivers. Go ahead. Treat yourself. You know, if you get thirsty, just, just drink it. It's fine. Um, and, and they see that, and they do that, and sometimes they get sick. There are stories locally here in Virginia of kids seeing that on television and drinking out of the, the, the stream or the creek or whatever and then contracting some kind of pathogen some kind of, 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 uh, of parasitic, you know, uh, organism, whatever. Um, so there, there are local stories of that, and I'm sure we're going to find those stories if we've prowled around deep enough across the country and across the world. Waterborne, waterborne illnesses kill more people uh, every year. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's in the millions. You know, they, they kill more people than, than so many other uh, dangers. Um, it's, it's, it's criminal uh, how many people have to drink you know, in, infected, you know, just, just, uh, just horribly tainted water every single day. But anyway, let me get off the soapbox. So you need, you need water, you need food, you need safe food that's going to give you the, the energy that you need to do all the tasks of survival. So survival is not sitting on a couch 
and, uh, and ordering takeout. It's a lot of hard work. You're out there busting your ass, building shelters, dragging in firewood, walking all over the place looking for typically marginal food supplies. So you're getting your greens and your leaves and your roots and your tubers and your berries and, and all that stuff's fine, but it's all low-calorie food. Unless you're able to get tree nuts in the fall or unless you're able to harvest animal foods, all of your, all of your stuff you're going to get out there is low-calorie. And, right. and that's, uh, it's, 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 not, it's not the gravy train with biscuit wheels that people imagine it is. Let me get in my sewing kit here and get out my biggest needle because I'm going to pop your little fantasy balloon that, you know, the average Joe can just live off the land um, with uh, a pocket knife and, and, uh, and a field guide. Um, lots of people starve in the wilderness, and they have since people started going into the wilderness. It just happens. Um, you know, uh, uh, not, I'm not talking about like the Donner Party where they get stranded in the mountains in the winter. Um, people just starve. Around here, some of my Powhatan ancestors um, used to call spring the starving season. So they had five seasons. They had summer, they had first fall, they had second fall, they had winter, and they had spring. And spring was nicknamed the starving season because you had probably eaten up all your winter food supply by then. And there's green growth all around you. All these plants are coming up. But they're all iceberg lettuce. They're just green shit and water. Um, yeah, there's some vitamins and minerals in there, but you can't live off of iceberg lettuce. And uh, so people, people did starve in the springtime before they were able to get more substantial food supplies in the summer, whether it was crops that they grew or, uh, you know, uh, berries and, and, you know, active, active animals running around they could harvest or, or whatever. So a lot of people starved in the spring with a belly full of green leaves because there's not enough calories in it. Um, right. Here's here's right. your here's your here's your sound bite for today. Yeah. Okay. Survival equals calories. If I had to boil down survival into one solitary word, it's calories. You are in a constant state of losing calories in your environment and through your activities when you're out in survival mode. You're constantly losing. You're like a you're like a leaky sieve, and and calories are are water somebody's dumping in there. And you're just constantly losing, losing, losing. The cold air, the, 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 the tasks, you know, all the, all, the, all the busy work you're doing. Um, you're constantly losing calories. And, and your job is to try to mitigate that loss. You want to stop that loss as much as possible. That's why we build a shelter so we don't lay on the ground shivering all night. That shelter saves us calories that we would have lost to the cold air. That's why we boil the water so we don't get amoebic dysentery and, and crap our guts out until we die. We spend a few extra calories building a fire and boiling the water, and then we drink safe water, and we're not losing those calories we'd be losing if we got dysentery. You know, that's why we do the different things that we do. We are stopping calorie loss, and hopefully we are finding calories to take in. So hopefully you are finding the edible plants, Hopefully you're harvesting game animals. Hopefully you're fishing. Hopefully you're doing some food gathering task every day and you're getting some calories back in the system. I, I joke, it's almost like a small business. Your body's a small business. So you, you start off in your survival situation. You've got some fat around your midsection. Okay, that's the capital that you started the business with. And you're running around doing all these things and the, the calories are the money. So you're spending calories to build a shelter. You're spending calories to find a, a safe water source. You're spending calories to, to get firewood. You're spending calories to, to make signals that can signal for help and, and all this other stuff. So you spend all these calories, and you're losing weight, and, and you know, you're, you're, kind of, you're kind of going down, down, down. And then hopefully you are going to walk around, spend some calories walking around, and find some edible plants, and that brings some calories in. So that's like your first customer at your business. And, and so you bring in that. So now we've got some money coming in. All right, great. It wasn't enough to keep the lights turned on and, and make this a sustainable business, but it, it was something, okay? It was something. And then hopefully you do better. Maybe, you, maybe your trap catches an animal. Okay, great. I've got all the calories I needed for one whole day. So now, now I'm, I'm not losing weight anymore 
I, I, I maintain my body weight for that day. And then maybe the next day, you know, you get a big animal and you've got a couple of days worth of meat and fat there. So now you can actually start getting ahead. It's like you're putting money in the bank when you put fat on your ass. Um, and so if you think of the body as, as like a small business and the, the job of survival is you trying to keep that business open, you know, you're trying to make a sustainable business. So you call it primitive economics. You can call it caloric economics. I don't care what the hell you call it. But, but that's how some people really get it. That's yeah. when they get it. They're like, oh, yeah, calories are money. Okay, I get it now. I've got to spend it to make it. You, know, you can't open a business and not spend a dime because you're not going to make any money. You've got to spend it to make it back. And, and then people get it. But, but that's your, that's your soundbite. If survival yeah. is anything, survival equals calories. Well, and, and that is, in a way, what worries me the most about you know, myself as a survivalist. is um, So years ago, I did a, a, a show about a primitive uh, a sort of – I made a show about this uh, drug rehab program for kids in Utah where they did primitive survival as a way of sort uh -huh. of getting them back in touch with themselves. And I spent, uh -huh. you know, 42 days off the grid in Utah, and I got pretty proficient with a lot of things like fire starting and sleeping and building shelters and finding shelters and water. But the one thing is food. You know, we made, uh, yep. we made traps, we made snares. We never caught anything, and the only way we didn't die was that we had airdrops of cans of tuna, you know, yep. uh, landing for us. So how do you get proficient at finding enough to eat? Practice, 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 practice. That's that's how you um, you can start with edible plants because that's the food that can't run away. That's the food that can't swim away or fly away or outsmart your traps. So you train your eye to seek out the details in nature. You train your eye to look for you know this color of berry, and you tra train your eye to look for that shape of leaf. And with with attention to detail a person can learn how to forage for, for wild foods. And if they are lucky, you know, if the good Lord wants them to, to live, they're going to live. And so maybe they will be in the survival situation in autumn and the tree nuts are coming down off the trees. So a pound of acorns, regardless of species, is, is roughly 2,000 calories. And, and it's not that many acorns. And so plenty of trees make, you know, just – dozens of pounds of acorns um, on a good year. So if you've got a, a forest mixed with some oak and some other trees, you know, I mean, you could, be, you could be sitting on top of thousands of pounds of acorns. And this was one of the staple foods that many of our Native American ancestors lived off of. Um, it was very common to spend part of your autumn collecting all these acorns, breaking the shells off of them, disrupting the bugs that would be living in there, and, and then storing that, that dried acorn, you know, basically as, uh, as a flour. You know, you, you could grind it up and make flour out of it, and then you could do porridge or baked goods or, or whatever you want to do with it. But um, if you were in the right time and place, you could live off of plants. Yeah, that's but a great tip. Now, with, a, with acorn specifically, I, I, I'm sorry to go uh -huh. into such detail, but what do you no, have to do, do to, to treat them? Uh, I, th I, I thought you had to do something special with acorns to treat them before you could eat them. Yeah, yeah, you absolutely should. Um, now, if, if, they, if they aren't too bitter, you could eat maybe a handful at a time and not have any stomach upset. But what I do is I crack the shells off of them, and I just break them with rocks. And that ends up breaking them into little chunks, which is perfect. I want that anyway. So I, I get the shells off, I break the acorns into little chunks, and I soak them in warm water. And once that water gets sort of tea-colored, it'll look like iced tea. Um, so once the water looks like iced tea, then I will dump that water off. And if it's potable water, if the water was safe to drink, I'll go ahead and taste a piece of the acorn. And if it's not too bitter, then I can go ahead and eat them. But if it's still bitter, I'll put more warm water on them and let them soak for another couple hours. And I'll just repeat that soak, dump off, soak, dump off process with, with clean water, and at some point, you're going to flush out enough of the tannic acid that those acorns are not going to taste bitter, and they're not going to upset your stomach. Tannic acid is very healing to human skin, so that first tea-colored water that you pull off the acorns, you can save that, 
and you can apply it to virtually any kind of skin problem. Now, it can be cuts, scrapes, scratches, burns. It can be poison ivy. It can be ingrown toenails. It can be, you know, bacterial infections, fungal infections. I don't care what's wrong with your skin. You can even swish it around in your mouth if you have a toothache. It tastes horrible. It's so bitter. But as long as you don't swallow that tannic acid, you can use it topically or, you know, in your mouth uh, as a very, uh, a very healing liquid. Um, and so you save that first water, and then the rest you'll dump away. Um, or dump it in a bucket and use it to help you tan a hide. Um, you know, we, we get the, the, the concept of tanning and the word tanning from, from tannin. It's tannic acid or tannin in the, in the acorns and in so many other trees and plants. Um, those are closely tied, you know, the, both, both the words uh, and the materials. Um, so, and that's why we say we tan leather. Um, that's where the word comes from. Wow, but, um, this is great. Uh, I mean, you know, acorns, you know, yeah, the acorn, that's a great tip. Doc, uh, do they, they have acorns everywhere? Uh, we've got some trees with them, but nothing like, nothing like, the, you know, Midwest or, or East. Yeah. In fact, I was going to ask Tim, there's a question about pine nuts. Super mm-hmm. high energy food, find them in pine cones, but there's a survival dilemma as to whether or not you can acquire them fast enough before you starve to death. <laughs> in other words, it takes effort. Yeah. So, you know, that just might be what you do all day long, just trying to live. Yeah, yeah, that's your day job. So you hope, yeah. you hope you have one of those species that has developed over the millennia to, to deal with, with fire. They, they deal with forest fire. Um, some pine cones open up once they are exposed to the high heat of a fire. And that's their strategy to reseed a forest after a forest fire has burned through. So you hope you have some of those fire, those fire activated uh, pine cones that will, that will creep open uh, when you put them by the fire and then you can get the pine nuts out easier. But yeah, I'm totally with you. I mean, it's like eating crab legs. Like I'm getting hungrier doing all this work to, uh, to open these damn things up. But, um, (laughs) but, but all, all jokes aside, you know, they are very high calorie and, um, any of those edible tree nuts. So we could eat beech nuts. We could eat acorns. We could eat hickory nuts, walnuts. Uh, there's so many different different tree nuts that we chestnuts. can eat. Um, chestnuts and 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 all the all the rest. He's nuts. So that's. <laughs> and, and, and Mark, can yeah, you guys hear me? And, okay, there you go. I'm sorry. I that's, have my that's from back on. in the day. Yeah. Yeah, that's from that's from way back in the day. Um, but uh, sure, even some prairie, uh, even some mountain oysters. Uh, but um, uh. Yeah, but uh, with all that so, being um, said, you have to know the environment. I mean, we say this all the time. You have to know one where you're at, and what are, what's edible and what's not edible, and uh-huh. you have to practice. You can't oh, again yeah. the whole sugar coating thing. With okay, I'm gonna be. I have all this whiz bang badass gear. I got this new rifle. I got this new pistol. I got all this shit that I never even shot. I've never zeroed my weapon. I've never uh-huh. zeroed my scope, or my house just burned down, and yeah. anarchy is coming, and my weapon yep. dropped, my gun dropped, my sights were knocked off. Did I re-zero my gun? I'm going to go shoot the biggest deer out there because they're, they're all over the place. There's plenty yeah. of whitetail here. When's the last time sure. you've done that? When's the last time <laughs> you squeezed a round off and killed an animal? When's the last time you caught a fish? When's the last time you built a snare? and caught a squirrel or yeah. a muskrat, or when did you practice it? When did you uh-huh. get your scent off of a snare? When did you go gather edible plants? Did you look at the things in your area that were poisonous versus what's edible, and you grabbed the wrong shit, and now, yes, your those nuts itch because you hit poison <laughs> ivy or poison oak or sumac or something else. You uh-huh. have to practice. And you got to practice yeah, you that do. load on your back. And uh-huh. yeah, all these things that, again, a lot of people in this community, just because they think they read a book or they sit at a desk or they think they're an authority because they have some stored food in their house, how are you going to do that when your house burns down, the shit hits the fan, people are trying to kill you, people are trying to rape your wife, your daughter, steal all your shit? How are you going to evade? How are you going to gather food? How are you going to find a shelter? How are you going to acquire water? 
What if water's not readily available? What if you're in horrible conditions? All mm-hmm. these things that we're doing this so you can think about them and you can yeah. think about worst case scenarios and you can plan accordingly or plan Amen, for brother. contingencies. Yeah. 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 Amen. Uh, um, yeah, you, I love you have to practice. You have to practice and you have to practice under shitty conditions. Yep. You have to. If you go out and make fire on a nice, dry, sunny day with all the little dry sticks you found laying on the ground because you're right. in the middle of a drought, you're not going to learn anything. You, know, nope. you could hand a lighter to a toddler and they could go light a fire. Um, you're going to learn something when you go out on the day where it's pissing and raining and windy and cold, and then you're trying to make a fire. And, and maybe you even set some tougher parameters. Like, I'm going to make a fire in the rain just with, you know, let's say I'm going to allow myself three matches. I'm only going to take three matches in the box out there and no knife. So then what? You know, what are you going to do? How do you make a fire in the rain with no knife to carve off the wet bark or to make fuzz sticks or feather sticks or to carve Mm -hmm. off pieces of fat wood? How the hell do you do that? Um, And so that's when when you go from being an information harvester because a lot of people do that. You know, a lot of people watch YouTube, and there's nothing wrong with that. You can learn a lot. And a lot of people read books. Hell, I write books. I want you to buy them. I want you to read them. I want you to enjoy them and use them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But the disconnect comes when you are content and just remain an information harvester. Oh, I don't need to know how to tie knots. I've got an app on my phone that has knot tying. I don't need to know how to do that. Um, You know, you're, you're just collecting data, but you have no experience. What I do for people when I teach classes here in Virginia, I give them hands-on experience while they are being challenged. So, for example, in many exercises, I'll put a time constraint, and then I'm running around, and I'm, I'm, I'm fussing at them, and I'm barking at them, and I'm yelling at them, and, and I'm trying to give them that little, that little panicky, frustrated, you know, I'm trying to give them that, that, that feeling of discomfort um, I'm trying to stress them a little bit and and Mm -hmm. that's that's really hard to that's really hard to uh, to fabricate you know it's hard to manufacture stress but but quite often I'll I'll, I'll give them time constraints and and other types of of uh, of things to think about while they're working and um, and I, I want them to be ready to do these skills if they are under stress and really the only way to do that and and be be halfway sure about it is to train under stress. Thank you so much, Tim, for being on. And um, I'd like to have you on here again because I feel like you're such a, a wealth of knowledge. You've been listening to The Survivalist Podcast with Mark Puhali, Doc Montana, and Matt Gould. Brought to you by Survival Cash, Forge Survival Supply, Epic Water Bottles and Filters, and The Perry Blade. Please visit our website, thesurvivalistpodcast.com, for more information. One more thing, please give us a review of the show, either on iTunes or Podbean or Stitcher, wherever you listen to it, please give us a review. They're very important to us and they help us out a lot. And thanks again for listening.